different Hello, ones. welcome to the Donahue Group. <laughs> We're getting started now, if you all don't mind, and uh, in slightly It'll different fine. posture here. will be fine. Proceed. William Buckley is here. <laughs> Ken Risto, Director of the World at the Sheboygan Area School District, is channeling William F. Buckley today. It's and a tribute. It's, it's an tribute. homage. It's, it's an homage to a great man, Tom Potter, retired DPI, um, Assistant Superintendent of Library Services, State Senator, and overall smart guy. Tom Paneski, math professor at UW Sheboygan. I'm Mary Lynn Donahue. I'm a lawyer at O'Neill Cannon Holman de Young here in town. I can actually say the name now without halting, so that's <laughs> they required that in order to, for me to continue to get a paycheck. I am back from two weeks in India, and yet welcome back. I have paid close attention to the local scene, and I think we have a lot to talk about. I missed a real snow day. February 6th, a day that will live in infamy, 14 inches of snow, and some people got to stay home. When I did get back, I found that I was slipping and sliding into frozen ruts <laughs> in the road, and uh, uh, the mayor being excoriated for uh, bad uh, snow plowing. I thought his editorial in the newspaper to address that was pretty good. I'm, I'm surprised the press let him do that. Did you happen to, to catch that? No? I read it. I mean, mayors live and die in snow plowing. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. And it's cost Harold Washington his job in Chicago. Jane Byrne. Yeah, Jane Byrne took his place. Yeah. No, no. Oh, I'm Jane sorry, Byrne no, Jane Byrne lost, lost her job. Uh, Thank Harold you, Tom. I stand correct. I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's enough right. homage. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> to Mr. I really Buckley. miss him already. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Jane Byrne's lost her job because she couldn't get the snow removed properly. It's been just a tough battle. I mean, it's what weird combinations. A lot of our, you know, uh, inner parts of the city is, just weren't designed to have cars parked on both sides, and everybody's playing, you know, municipal ping pong. It it's just, it. just difficult. Yeah. And people don't stay home. And no home. salt. I mean, you know. They don't stay home. They pack it down, and when a plow comes, it just can't yeah. remove it from the pavement. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. Your school district wasn't any better. So, I mean, our, our lots, no matter where you went to, were pretty much like walking on the lunar landscape. Um, and same challenges the guys faced. There's just not much you can do about it. Well, I did pay my own particular homage to the ice on the sidewalk by taking a complete full out, legs up in the air, flat on my back mm -hmm. fall. Uh, that was just really, and I hopped right up and continued on. And Good bones. <laughs> and drinking the milk. Good. <coughs> or something, but well, yeah. in any event. <laughs> you, well, you were loose. <laughs> Well, I was relaxed. <laughs> we hope that, uh, I guess I heard next week, it's supposed to be in the what, 40s or something. It's supposed to About warm time, up. the average high. And all these big street ruts, mm -hmm. ice ruts, I guess mm -hmm. I'm calling, that they mm -hmm. still exist somewhere. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, maybe they'll finally melt away, and then we'll have the potholes, which we have to deal with. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we'll just uh, make our way to summer, I guess. But, well, uh, as the mayor pointed out in his editorial, Quite to the point, I thought, an old man comes by as he's shoveling his sidewalk and says, well, that's Wisconsin in winter. The interesting question is what kind of pressure that puts on, a, you know, an incredibly tight city budget oh, yeah. where there's just no extra room for anything. And although maybe we could talk a little bit about retiring the marina debt, we could retire the marina debt and buy like a big heap of sand. What do you think? Or beet juice. <laughs> Beet juice is now being touted, unfortunately, at $2.50 a gallon as a wonderful um, ice melter. And, um, um, is that your investment tip for the day? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of, the, one, of, one of the... I'm serious. I'm serious. One there of the was... stories in the, in the press today was about the marina debt. I think uh, the finance committee would, and Alderman Gisha and uh, maybe somebody else think that would be a good idea. They retire the debt, save some interest money. But some of the money would come from the motor vehicle fund and the public works department and the people were thinking they need that money to purchase equipment and mm -hmm. trucks and they're not, they're reluctant to say, uh, use it to retire the marina debt. So the council has some uh, items to think about and motor vehicle fund is supposed to be used for motor vehicles in my view of Except it's got $8 million in it. Not anymore after they used quite a bit of it to what, to retire some pension uh, debt okay. and stuff like that. Right. Have they already done that? I mean, I think that's actually a good use of public Yeah, well, they funds. had more than they needed. But I think mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's the kind of problem that the, at least the city is going to talk about, and it's back and forth. And I think Public Works has a yeah. legitimate... Uh, 
uh, concern. Uh, it's a rough winter. Equipment's going to take a beating. They need replacement parts. They need replacement vehicles. Be nice to retire the debt, <laughs> but. <laughs> how, does anyone know how, how large is the marina debt at this point? I think they said 1.3 million or okay. something. I, I thought it was around a million, but. Okay. Plan to pay off Sheboygan's 1.275 million debt on the Harbor Center. So 1.3 million. I mean, the city is bumping up against its debt um, ceiling, and mm. uh, um, they've imposed, self-imposed a lower debt ceiling that state law would allow, but nonetheless, it's a lot of debt. And oh. <laughs> while it certainly supports municipal bonds and so forth, it's, in my view, kind of a stupid way to spend your money. So, uh, so it'll be interesting to see well, how it plays out. You don't out. eliminate that perpetual analysis every year about the marina losing money. You know, it's, it's, it's oh, just yeah. something that sort of rubs salt in the wound about whether this should have been done in the first place. I mean, Sheboygan needed a marina. It's built. It's yep. Without the debt uh, aspect of it, it's probably doing fairly well. So let's get back to it, seeing it as an asset for the community. Mm -hmm. Which I think it clearly is. I mean, you go along cities on our sea coast, our lake coast, um, I think the Sheboygan Marina is the most beautiful that I, I mean, certainly to my view, nicer than Manitowoc and nicer than, uh, I mean, Algoma and Kiwani are mm -hmm. kind of charming, but they're not, I, I mean, I, I just think that our marina is, is quite nice. So it has a lot of big buildings, but uh, maybe they didn't need to make it quite so luxurious, but uh, in any event. Well, the next time, dear viewers, that we talk about this, uh, hopefully the snow will be at least somewhat melted and we won't get an April blizzard and... Although I'd like another snow day, I, you know. Oh, let, let me just throw get my snowshoes and go to work. When we go to, to India, work. you can stay back. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me throw a little political twist to the the. Alderman Vicky Meyer is chair, I think, of the Public Works Committee, and they're arguing to use the motor vehicle fund for mm -hmm. motor vehicles. Alderman Gisha is, you know, the, and is chair of the finance committee or on the finance committee. You know, Hannah's chair of the finance committee. Right. But, but okay. he's supporting it. And they're supporting it. So they also had that rift between the two on what was said outside of council. So we got the political people back again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I think you need that. <laughs> in order to make a good decision, you have to have some knowledge of what your capital costs are going to be in terms of motor vehicle replacement. If it's two million, then then you know what you need, and if it's eight million, then you know what you, you need. need. And yep, if it's a yep. hundred thousand, well, then maybe we can spend it in other ways. But I think, you know, you need some fairly decent finance mm -hmm. or financial figures to tell you that. So. Yep. Yep. Well, let's get off the snow and stop being old grumps about things, and uh, and move on to. County City put shared services back on the table. There was actually a meeting of the um, City County Shared Services com uh, Committee uh, at the end of February. And uh, Alderman Mark Hanna said, quote, I'm the glass is half full type of person and I believe we have a renewed level of enthusiasm here. Um, I, I have to agree. I think it's a good idea to, I mean, that group had not met for really a very long time and to get back in the saddle again. And I think it's over the HR, human resources. Oh, yeah, yeah, I um, forgot about that. You know, possibilities of sharing services mm. and so forth, but. Um, so that's what's moving them off the, off the dime now again? I think so, I okay. think so, because I really think to move a really hard concept forward, you need some issue that will kind of propel you. And I think the HR position may where, just be that. Where is that? that it's still unresolved. We don't know what we're going to do. Right. Well, who's I. Who's acting HR right now? Susan Hart. She's still acting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think she's been doing that since November, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So. Okay. Um, any prognostications as to whether there will be success in terms of shared services? <laughs> well, I don't think it uh, looks good <laughs> for uh, a lot of success. Um, I think. There have been previous attempts, and uh, you know a lot of it isn't just city county; it's just whether we need the number of units of government we have at all in in the county and in the state generally. I mean, we've talked about before. You've got sanitary districts, you've got water districts, you've got this district and that district, and then you've got all these towns, and you've got 
various, well, how many fire, fire departments do we have and probably eight police departments. Um, at what point do you say there's a better way of delivering a service to 110,000 people that live in this county? That's not a lot of people, 110,000, but yet you have a lot of different units of government. And it's sort of like consolidation of school districts. Nobody wants to give up their own you little bet. town or their own little village. Yeah, yeah, and until yep. you get that change in attitude, yeah, I'm not so sure it's, it's come about. Uh, people still are very, very parochial. Mm -hmm. they, they live in Oostburg and they live in this town or that town, and that's how they view it. Yep. And uh, you know, if you look at communities like around Nashville or around Jacksonville, Florida, where they've gone to metro government, where their fire department, their police department, all their services, it's all county metro. Um, <laughs> those are people who've had large population growth around a big city and they just said this is crazy to have all these units of government because you don't even know where when you cross the street what municipality you're in. Uh, they have seen a, a reason to meld into one and that's where metro government has seemed to have been very successful. Mm -hmm. But when you get these units of government kind of spread out, it's tough to get people to start thinking differently. I'd like to see it. I think we have too many units of government. I think there are savings to be wrought in school district mergers and other areas. But I don't know how you get people in a democracy to say, yes, mm -hmm. uh, it's, I'm part of the problem rather than it's somebody else's problem. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. Yeah, people are, you know, in the school district, although there are people who just really, really, and perhaps it's just part of our, we've talked about this before, part of it is people feel they have so little impact on, on other things in their lives that local government is about the only place where they feel they can still have a say and can still have an impact on what's really, uh, really going on. And, you know, and so if you're living in Kohler or Sheboygan Falls and you're looking at, say, merging with the Sheboygan Area School District or Oostburg for that matter down the road, there just isn't any kind of, of interest in that. They, they know who their school superintendent is, he's on a face-to-face -face basis at the diner, you know who your alderman is, you, you know, it's just your that sort of, chairman. Yeah, yeah, that sort of, that, that kind of familiarity is really tough for people to let go. Mm -hmm. um, you remember maybe when Governor McGallum was uh, proposing a reduction in shared revenue and he said to all, all these entities get together, find out to save uh, dollars because we're proposing to cut back on the shared revenue. It was he had, he mentioned it. I, he knew it was a losing proposition because everybody rose up. Not me. Not me. Mm -hmm. Not me. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, and unfortunately, I think McCallum kind of made municipalities out to look like bad guys, and and they're not. Uh, I mean, I think that you know our local units of government try very hard to deliver good services, and they're thoughtful about it. And some are more successful than others. Some are more intentional about providing good services than others, but I mean, overall, I think um, you can actually accomplish things without bribing people, as in India, you just need to have a wad of bills with you <laughs> if you need to get anything done in, in, a, in a society which seems to have almost nothing in the way of infrastructure. So I kept asking our guide, I do municipal law, I'm interested, where do you get your water? <laughs> From the rivers, I saw I saw not one healthy river, and of course it was before the monsoon season. But I digress. Let's get back to the Sheboygan, and, and um, as soon as I got back, I was uh, lucky enough to again be the uh, voting the vote reporter for the League of Women Voters, calling in vote returns and so forth. What really surprised me in the um, Democratic primary, uh, I mean Barack. As we say, those of us who run for office say, Hillary got a schwetzing <laughs> in the state of uh, Wisconsin as a whole. I mean, a serious schwetzing. Of course, Obama spent, I think, five times more money here yes. than yes, she did. did. And um, so that maybe that's what spending five times the amount of money will get you. But um, what was interesting to me in Sheboygan County, the numbers were closer. Obama got about 53% and Clinton got about uh, 46%. So those numbers were smaller. Interestingly enough as well, Mike Huckabee got closer to John McCain yes. uh, in Sheboygan County, and that was a 51 to 41 split. And um, I think on the state level, again, those numbers were quite a bit more spread out. 55-37, McCain Huckabee. There you go. <laughs> You misspoke. It's right here on the page, right here. <laughs> right here. It's right there. I haven't heard in front of me. <laughs> I'm going to 
wanted to do this for the whole episode. I'm sorry. <laughs> do you remember? But, but that's not too surprising. I mean, when you think back, I mean, within the Sheboygan County uh, jurisdiction, we've got uh, a pretty strong conservative religious base of folks uh, within the city, certainly, and Oostburg and Cedar Grove sort of pride themselves on on the Dutch Reformed tradition. And I think you know Huckabee was really right. obviously Darling focused on. Right. Yeah, he's focused. He's focused his candidacy on that. Sure. Um, and so the fact that he got four percentage points more in Wisconsin, I mean, Sheboygan County, than in Wisconsin is not too surprising. Um, and Hillary did well with older folks in yep. Sheboygan County demographics. So we do have a rather mm -hmm. sizable elderly population. And organized labor, I think, mm -hmm. tends to be, not necessarily uniformly by any stretch, but tends to be more pro-Clinton. Mm -hmm. Just because she's been around longer and has built those relationships, I think, that Obama doesn't have. And uh, so I thought, I thought it was interesting. It does point out to me, though, again, and Tom, this will make you a happy person, is that Sheboygan County grows more and more and more and more and more conservative as time goes on. Just overall, I think I live that in a wise county, don't I? What <laughs> <laughs> a radio station that we're going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it's, it's interesting. Um, well, not well, not, not, but again, you, the, the Tom Toms from the, from the radio, from the noise radio, was really anti McCain. And, yeah. and uh, people are pretty much ignoring um, you know, that, that, that crowd of who was screaming that he's not conservative enough and he can't be trusted. It's the end of the Republican Party as we know it. Uh, I mean, what do you think? Because, primaries. I mean, you're a Rush Limbaugh fan. Oh, yeah. What I mean, what Rush the, was one of his... Uh, I mean, McCain, pretty, uh, you know, I guess the thing that, about my opinion about McCain... Well, what do you, I mean, where do you think Rush is coming from in terms oh. of making these assaults? I mean, I don't think... He's Republican. having fun. It's ratings, right? It's Ray. He's an entertainer, and he has fun. It's, it's like the wrestlers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he really is. And I mean, yeah. you, if you now, listen to him long enough, I mean, basically, he's an entertainer. Sometimes he goes off the deep end every once in a while. But he's, you know. You mean like in Days Ending and Why? <laughs> and he has, he has great parodies. He puts, yeah. <laughs> That was Good. a Buckley moment, wasn't it? <laughs> that a Buckley? <laughs> <laughs> Days ending in Y. <laughs> that was good. But, uh, yeah. So he's, in, he's enjoying it. And, uh, and he basically likes, uh, he really was anti-McCain uh, uh, because he didn't think McCain adhered to what he really believes in from his strong conservative principles. I mean, McCain's so he was pretty conservative. That. I mean, if you yeah. peel away, you know, some of the rhetoric, I mean, McCain is... Very conservative. Oh yeah, I he's pro-life, mm -hmm. and he's uh, national security, and there's probably some other areas that uh, he's very conservative on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, wants that Iraqi war to continue. But in any event, that was not my thought as much um, to debate our respective oh, sure. candidates as much as um, what the radio folks were doing. Were Sykes and uh, Wagner? Those are our, our folks in Milwaukee. Were they as anti-McCain? Uh, yes. Well, Mark Belling was. Oh, the Belling, same kind Belling. of thing. Mark uh -huh. Belling is in, in mm -hmm. he he a uh, strong conservative. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't know who, McKenna? There was an, a woman in the morning. Okay. Nancy McKenna, I think she was too. Okay. So it was, they were kind of beating the drum. Channeling Ann Coulter. Let's switch to a higher level of conversation. I don't have any these problems. With these <laughs> you don't have any problems. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Cal. Now, now. I like, I like the segue from Ann Coulter to a higher plane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're okay, fair no. and balanced, yeah. fair and balanced, and not telling any lies. Um, I want to spend the rest of our time, if we can, talking a little bit about an issue that I think is huge for the state of Wisconsin, has kind of run under the radar, and that's the Great Lakes Compact, which is currently in the legislature to be uh, ratified um, uh, were the, I think, the last of the eight states that are involved in this. Uh, it's kind of like passing the Equal Rights Amendment, as far as I can see, as we're trying to get this around and so forth. I attended um, a short press briefing that Lieutenant Governor Lawton did a couple days ago about this and really laying out the, the politics of the situation. It has passed the um, Senate resoundingly. Uh, 26, 26 to 6. 26 Yesterday, to 6. as we taped this program. Lieutenant Governor Lawton said that Assembly um, Speaker Hipsch, have I pronounced that right? Correct. From West Salem. From, from, from West Salem is refusing 
just clear out, refusing to um, put the bill in any committee which would allow its introduction on the floor. Uh, and so it's dead. And, um, which is as right as Speaker. Exactly. Yes. I right. Mean, yeah. right. I mean, it's an okay. enormous I mean, amount of control. People need to know that that's one of the powers of the Speaker. Yeah. So. And, um, um, and the, is there any way around that, really? You can, you can pull bills uh, off the committee floor or off the, the general assembly floor. But if you did that over the speaker, you would probably have any committee chairperson who voted that way no longer a committee chairperson, as well as other hell to pay for the people who would uh, buck the chairperson. That person's a little dictator mm -hmm. uh, in essence, and so um, you don't see that happen. Cal, tell us, if you will, just a little bit about what the pact is. We don't have a huge amount of time left, but I mean, well, it's as a you mentioned, it's uh, eight Great Lakes states and uh, Ontario and Quebec and Canada. It's actually federal legislation. It has to be ratified by the states. And once it's ratified by the states, then it gets the official stamp of Congress and goes into the power of law. And in essence, uh, what has taken place is that in 2005, the governors of the eight states and the provincial uh, leadership in Canada had got together and drew up a pact that basically says that if you draw water from the lakes, you return it to the lakes and any other use uh, other than a few exceptions, such as a bottling plant, I guess there's a, uh, they set a, a number of gallons per container. There's, because there's some bottling pants. Nestle has one in Michigan where they bottle their water and they ship it out. But I guess if you don't bottle so many gallons uh, and ship it out, you can do, mm -hmm. continue to do business. But in essence, what you need to do is return the water to the basin. And the problem, of course, is that Wisconsin, while we're on Lake Michigan, once you get beyond Milwaukee, uh, and Sheboygan, you get over to Fond du Lac and so on, you are no longer in the Lake Michigan Basin, you are in the uh, in the Mississippi River Basin. And so communities that now are finding radon in their water or they're finding uh, low volumes in their wells are looking for the big sugar daddy to the east to get them out of their water problem. And so this is one of the problems that they have is how do you return the water that you use uh, mm -hmm. for whatever purpose in that community back uh, sort of uphill uh, to Lake Michigan. And so you've got a, a difference of opinion as to whether there ought to be that type of control of the water that's so close to these communities by governors who are in other states. Um, in that sense, the PAC says unless, if everybody agrees that this is a prohibition, that's the stand, that when you start, uh, when you get one person you can stop something. In other words, if a governor of Illinois decides that they don't want uh, Waukesha or New Berlin or some community to draw water out of Lake Michigan, uh, that's an objection that needs to be recognized. So that's one of those issues that uh, seems to be in Ohio and Wisconsin being the stumbling block. Um, Ohio, I think some of it's some industrial uh, development issues because they have a number of uh, big plants that draw a lot of water. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other states have gone along and ratified this thing. And even, even you said, I think you said, the state Senate has ratified it 26 to 6. I think it's a long overdue. Uh, some of the articles that I've, uh, I've read is very con are very concerned about delay, which the speaker has about to do. But the delay is that at what point does Wisconsin and other states in the Middle West start losing congressional delegation and clout? And right now, Congress is receptive to respecting a pact such as this and the congressional delegations that exist in the Middle West. You start losing power politically up here, all of a sudden the Arizonas and Texas and Floridas and elsewhere <clears throat> grow in political power and say, we don't need to take care of these people up there or listen to them. We want that water. Let's." Uh, not have any type of pact. So right now we're, I think, in a very favorable position uh, nationally to do something to prevent other states from raiding the lakes. And it's just a shame that uh, we've got some people who are being so obstinate about this. Uh, Governor uh, or Lieutenant Governor Lawton uh, described uh, Governor Richardson, a uh, former candidate for president, talking about uh, that absolutely Arizona needs to get Great Lakes water and it just needs to happen. She calls it water lust. <laughs> and I thought that was actually a fairly, uh, fairly decent and description. And they look at it so differently. In one of the articles I read too, someone from Montana said, this is no different than iron ore or making cars or whatever. They've got water, let them sell it, we'll buy it and we'll ship it out. But the problem is, 
you know, the lakes historically only fluctuated about four to five feet in all mm -hmm. the thousands of years. And so if you start looking at global warming, you start looking at water being diverted and not being replaced, what's going to happen to the fishery? What's going to happen to the Great Lakes shipping? What's going to happen to the water supply? It's a quality of life in an economic situation for everybody that lives around those lakes. It isn't just a matter that that water can be shipped off and somehow miraculously it's going to bubble up from the bottom and, and be replaced. It isn't going to be. Well, See, in, in the and we, we don't have a whole lot of time, but let, Tom, I, if, but the, if but you want to talk a little bit, and we can certainly just go on into the state well, session the, with this the, too. Well, the veto, because uh, it had to be unanimous, uh, if one governor says water cannot be given to Waukesha, then that was it, wherever the governor was, whether it was Ohio, Illinois. And uh, one of the concerns was by the, the, the assembly leader was uh, he thinks, well, it's unfair that one governor could stop development in uh, uh, or aiding a, a community like Waukesha, like an Illinois governor could say, no, and that's it. Uh, and he even cited... Uh, so he was trying to push for a majority, but then I guess the governor's already signed on and they probably won't opt to go to a majority, not even two-thirds majority or three-quarters, you know. So he was saying, we, you know, this, we're giving up a lot once we do this. If he, and he cited, suppose companies from Illinois, et cetera, wanted to go to southeastern Wisconsin and they, want, they were outside the water basin and they needed water. Well, the governor of Illinois could say no. And of course, then they can't relocate in Wisconsin. They have to go back and uh, so, uh, it kind of impedes economic development a little bit for southeastern Wisconsin and the suburbs. They, it's a way to quelch growth in the suburbs. Sure. Lieutenant Governor Lawton did point out that um, the way the law is written now or the, the proposed compact is written now, those vetoes are not, cannot be made for just arbitrary or capricious reasons. There need to be, a, you know, there are certain standards by which a veto is measured and you may have more information about that, Cal, but um, I think... They the, could appeal. I mean, they'll, they'll, they have to satisfy all these standards, but then ultimately the governor could say, mm -hmm. well, just, they got all these, uh, they met all these conditions, but just not quite enough, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the big, the big measure is if you're not returning that water to the basin, it's going to go down the Mississippi, into the Mississippi and out to the ocean. And so if you've got, whether it's a yeah. steel plant or a bottling plant or a municipality, who's going to draw millions of gallons out of the lake and not return it like everybody else has to and what everybody else has accepted, I, I don't see how that's, that, that can be permitted. I don't see any objections probably. I don't think there would be objections to maybe New Berlin drawing from the water if they somehow piped back into the Milwaukee River or, or some other waterway to let the water go back in. But when it disappears to, forever. We have to wrap up, but we'll continue this conversation because it's the most interesting one. Thanks for joining us.